Okay, thank you so much. It's really wonderful to see you all. Um, thanks for hanging in all day. And it's really an honor to be on this panel with these amazing um, panelists. And I'm thrilled that you could join us, Tendai, from even though you couldn't be here. So um, we were asked in, in sort of wrapping this up to, to look at themes that we saw through the conference or things that were left out or things that that we might want to raise for further thought. So I'm just going to throw out a few ideas um, that I think um, have been striking to me. Um, the first goes to um, general themes that, that we've seen. And I think that, that one is certainly commonalities in our struggles, right? I mean, we've seen that they're very different. and and that there are lots of distinct issues. But we've also seen, I think, that there are incredible commonalities and that we, I think that, you know, that we need to really focus on how to leverage those. And I was thinking when we were um, talking earlier today about land struggles um, for black homeowners, but farmers in particular, and um, and I was thinking about the fact that the government, even though it put into place various programs to help people get access to land, et cetera, et cetera, it has worked very um, diligently, you might say, um, for the past 100 years to ensure that um, no support went to black ownership and that lots of support went to white ownership. Um, and, and in that context, I was thinking about how um, it, the issue was also raised about sort of the framing of the civil rights struggle and how there were movements outside of that that were really um, trying to figure out ways not just to work sort of in an assimilationist way within the system. And, and one of them that, that was brought up was um, the Republic of New Africa and their attempt to sort of get land and to establish an independent base. And one of the things that... that um, has occurred to me, and that I think is is certainly I see happening actively with folks who are still involved with the Republic of New Africa, is you know a consciousness of the fact that it's indigenous land they're talking about building a base on, and the need to recognize that, but not just to acknowledge it in some superficial way. But I think there's coming to be, at least among some folks, a recognition that you know the government's not going to actually help with this endeavor, but a coalition with indigenous people, a recognition that this is indigenous land and, you know, how can we actually, you know, establish some independent um, social, economic, political formations on indigenous land in cooperation with indigenous people. There's, there's a tremendous potential there. Um, and I think that that sort of points to something that I think is also a really important underlying theme that I don't think we got, I, w I wish we had been able, had, had time to sort of take the next step with, which of course we've covered so much ground, right? <laughs> um, so I'm not really, this is really not, really not a criticism, but we talked about land and we talked about labor a lot, right? And the other element I think with a settler colonial regime is social control, right? the need to have to exert control over all aspects of society. And we see that, right? There's nothing we can do that doesn't come under, you know, strict governmental control, that there's not laws about, um, you know, how you cross the street, whether you send your child to this school or that school, blah, blah, blah. I mean, every dimension of life is regulated. And every dimension of ideological and political life is also strictly you know, monitored at least, and pretty much regulated. Um, and this really struck me when Matthew was talking about how, you know, we can, we can, when he, when he was talking about putting the land in trust, right, and, and, and Indian tribal governments getting together the money to buy the land, but then they have to wait 10 years to get it into trust. And it's like, well, if they bought the land, why can't they just do what they want with the land? Right? And the, the difference is who's got jurisdiction on that land, right? if it's land in trust. And so 
you know, if you don't have jurisdiction, <coughs> even if you own something, you know, there, there's not much room to actually do something independent with it. And we've seen, if you just look historically over time, you know, with movements that have been, in essence, like little, small, separatist-type movements, but not separatist in some, like, threatening way. Just like, leave us alone, we just want to do our thing out here, please, you know. They have been seen as tremendous threats by the U.S. government and subjected to incredible attacks. You know, Republic of New Africa, again, being a, one example, but I mean, even, you know, Waco or whatever. I mean, it's not just people of color. It's anybody who, you know, really wants to reject the jurisdiction uh, or the immediate control of the government. And so I think we need to think about that question, not only of, of land and of economic justice and labor issues and migration issues, but we need to think about the question of social control and how that affects us. Um, and I don't know how much time we have. Are we? You've got five more minutes. Oh, okay. Six. <laughs> and 22 seconds. Oh, okay. 18 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> All right. Um, well, in that case, I will talk about a couple of other themes. Um, one is um, what I mentioned last night about what, things that are empowering versus disempowering. And to me, that's a really important question to raise in the context of reparations. Um, and. I would like to just give a quick example from my encounters with Japanese American reparations. My family, I told you last night, um, on my dad's side is um, Japanese American and they were interned. And when, when in the 80s, when my uncle in particular started working on, on reparations issues, I thought, you know, why? Like, why are you doing this? This is a waste of time. You know, the government knew what it was doing. You don't have to tell the government, you know, get it to realize that what it did was wrong. It knew it was illegal. It knew it was wrong. It doesn't care, right? Some token distribution of money from the government, like, and then they can wash their hands of it. Like, why, why are we doing this? Um, and I came. Luckily, you know, they didn't listen to me. Um, and they proceeded. And it turned out to be a really good thing. And I could see in the community what an important thing it was for people to talk, for people to share their stories, for people to have it, them listen to, for Congress to put out a report that had their stories in it, and, and to issue an official apology, and to get a letter from Ronald Reagan um, you know, saying, I'm sorry. I was like, ooh, kind of creepy. But nonetheless, you know, it really meant a huge you know, it made a huge difference to people who, you know, for 40 years had not talked about their experiences and were carrying all this trauma around. That said, it also, I think, illustrated the dangers of, of redress and reparations movements be, in that, how did that bill get past Congress? It got past Congress because, you know, there was because we were so loyal, right? We were locked up because they couldn't tell the loyal from the disloyal. Although miraculously, like, you know, two and a half years later, they managed to make the distinction by having us fill out questionnaires. But nonetheless, you know, the argument in Congress was, ooh, you know, at the time we couldn't tell the difference. But now they proved themselves to be so loyal, right? We need to reward that loyalty. So, like, what's being redressed? What's being acknowledged here? Not that it was illegal, not that it was wrong. Not that those who resisted, like Fred Korematsu and Gordon Hirabayashi and Min Yasui, for example, or the people who refused to be drafted and were imprisoned as draft resistors, you know, they weren't honored in that initial, I mean, they have come to be, some of them honored, but through a lot of struggle. Um, they weren't the, you know, they weren't the ones who were being held up. It was those of us who, you know, so cooperatively herded ourselves into concentration camps, right? That's what was being recognized and rewarded by the government. Now, we have managed, um, and I just want to put a little asterisk there in case anybody's getting upset about the word concentration camp. Even Roosevelt called them concentration camps. I am not talking about death camps. I am not talking about slave labor camps, okay? Um, lots of other Supreme Court justices, et cetera, called them concentration camps, not just not to. Um, but the point is that there was a narrative that was being put out in connection with redress. And so it doesn't mean that redress wasn't important, 
but it means that we really had to fight. Even after we got redress, we had to fight for the narrative and not allow that narrative, the government's version, to become the dominant, you know, the only one that was out there. Because if we had, I feel like it would have been overall a very disempowering, um, you know, happening occasion. Right? So we had to fight to make it an empowering one. And so again, it's like the same thing can happen, but they, they can be disempowering or empowering, and we really have to pay attention. And I think as we go forward, now that there's more openness society, socially um, to the idea of reparations and redress, we really need to pay attention to the way in which it's framed and the, the consequences of that. Um, so I will just leave it at that, because I bet my time Thank is up. Thank you very much. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for being here and staying through the end of the day. Um, Dan and Britton, I really appreciate being invited and meeting you. And not so it's been such an honor to participate in the celebration of your book and also have the chance to share ideas with you. And I'm still taking notes. Okay. Um, how's the sound now? We really have to speak right into it. Okay. Um, so I, I encountered um, Natsu's book when it was still in page proofs and manuscripts, I think, because my co-author Angela Riley and I, who work in indigenous people's law, were writing an article entitled Decolonizing Indigenous Migration, somewhat inspired by Tendai's um, Decolonizing Migration article, to think about the ways that borders had crossed our own peoples. Um, the settler state had displaced our laws and traditions and customs. Um, and that um, we wanted to push the envelope on some of the limits of federal Indian law, as well as migration law, which we were less expert in, to um, consider that conversation in a way that Natsu's book really helped us do through her advancement of settler colonialism as a way of dealing with race and other issues in the US. Um, and I think that the point I want to make in my short time here um, picks up on strategy, I guess. I, I really appreciate Natsu's work for its critical framing, and it has, as I said, helped, helped me um, and my co-author in that regard. And then as somebody who works with indigenous communities, my you know, immediate question, and their immediate question when I'm asking as a lawyer is, well, and then what? W what's the remedy going to be? Because it's, it's hard to ever stop at you know, theory or concept when you have clients um, right in front of you or community members or relatives. And in that respect, I was really intrigued by an exchange between Matthew Fletcher and Aziz Rana, I think somewhere between the first and third panel regarding the utility of international law in addressing these American struggles. And I was intrigued for two reasons. Um, one is this question of whether and how much we can work with the law as it is. And a number of the presentations were about you know, milking property law for as much as it can possibly be milked um, in Professor Mitchell's discussions, for example, about um, the Uniform Air Act and uh, takings claims and various other aspects of um, black property dispossession. And we've thought about civil rights law, and of course, in our field, we think about federal Indian law. And one of the strategies we've all employed probably is pushing those doctrines, which are legacies of the settler colonial experience, as far as they can possibly be pushed but then, at least in my experience, we always bump up on limits, and limits that are uh, fundamental and unsatisfying, um, and places where we really can't stop if we have communities of concern um, that we're attached to. And so the other approach is more fundamental societal change, um, or at least legal reform as part of that. And I guess um, in these remarks, and in my life, um, I'm coming down on the side of law and society reform that's much more uh, transformative than merely working with, for example, the law of property, which is what I spent the first 15 years of my career doing, or federal Indian law, um, which I also spent a, a long, frustrating time um, trying to mobilize in support of people I love and care about. 
Um, and so um, I'll say more specifically about how I think um, international human rights law can be useful in my field of indigenous peoples. Um, but what I'd like to pose to all of you is whether international human rights law can also be um, useful transformatively for other communities of concern. And I think there are at least a few seeds in some of um, my own work and some of the dialogue we've had today. Um, I haven't heard too much today about the Global Compact on Migration, but of course it takes a human rights approach to migration, which has historically been un understood as a you know, security and uh, foreign relations and national boundaries concern. Um, CERD, the Committee to Eliminate Racial Discrimination, just issued its report on the United States a couple of months ago, um, and it called on the US to address issues of racist crimes, hate speech, police brutality against African Americans, also through the lens of, well, the CERD Convention, but, but human rights um, more generally. Um, so I'll pose sort of that question for other communities of concern and sort of share where I am on federal Indian law and human rights. And, Hopefully, um, Britain will knock me over when I go too long, because I actually didn't set my timer. Um, but I'll share that I, I did work as a lawyer and scholar for a very long time in federal Indian law. And the areas where I worked were religious freedoms and child welfare. And in every single one of those cases, we reached the Supreme Court and lost in a devastating way. So the Supreme Court held an adoptive couple versus baby girl in 2013, that notwithstanding the protections of the Indian Child Welfare Act, um, a white family had the right to remove a Cherokee child from her perfectly competent Cherokee father um, because of a, a very narrow approach to this statute, which, as, my, as Matthew said, was enacted to remedy past takings of Indian children from their families. In the religious freedoms arena, it's been just as bad. The Supreme Court has held that the federal government has the right to destroy American Indian sacred sites, even if it would virtually destroy the religion notwithstanding the First Amendment, and even though this was 30 years ago, the courts apply this holding every day of the week to authorize the destruction of another American Indian religion. So given that those were the two areas where I was working and those were the limits that we hit um, in the US Supreme Court, um, I, you know, by working with actual clients and people became very disenchanted. There was nowhere to go in the US. And I think I, along with many indigenous um, scholars, lawyers, community members, decided to explore more the international human rights movement. And it turns out that indigenous peoples have been working first at the League of Nations and then at the United Nations since e each of them was founded. This is not a new movement, um, but it has a particularly energetic uh, opportunity right now in that the, the UN adopted the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in 2007. And Matthew kind of left off his talk with that moment um, and suggested that the Declaration is an opportunity for more transformative reform. I just finished five years on the United Nations Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. I was the member from North America working around the entire world to implement the declaration. So actually the project of trying to do it in the US is actually smaller. But um, I learned a lot in that um, experience. And I learned that the declaration takes on settler colonial legacies, laws, and realities absolutely head on. Um, with respect to US law, the declaration provides that indigenous peoples have a right to their lands and to restitution of their lands, not just monetary damages as we have in the best possible scenario under the Fifth Amendment. It also provides that as a matter of the right to life, indigenous peoples um, have the right to a continued existence, which they don't have as a matter of federal Indian law, where we have plenary power, which the federal government has used to terminate tribes um, as recently as 70 years ago. Um, it also provides um, and contextualizes in the law of genocide that um, indigenous families have the right to take care of their children and have them not removed from the group. So when it comes to indigenous people's rights and their experiences in the settler colonial realities where we live, the Declaration has certain of these substantive rights that I think are very helpful. It doesn't shy away from taking on the settler colonial foundations that our domestic laws, to be frank, just can't do. The survival of the United States kind of requires, at least in its current iteration, the ability to freely take indigenous people's lands without compensation in many contexts. More broadly, the Declaration, I think, transformatively recognizes both individual and collective rights, calls explicitly for remedying past harms and ensuring ongoing rights, 
recognizes duties and relationships to future generations, and not only has these substantive rights, but articulates duties of states to take action. So I think that an instrument like the Declaration, the Declaration itself in our context, can inspire law reform, um, perhaps societal reform. And I'll just say practically, and this is partly in response to Professor Rana, is, is this likely to happen, given that the US is so strongly turning away from its um, human rights commitments, international commitments more broadly? And I think when the Declaration was adopted, even many of us in the federal Indian law community said, well, this is never going to happen. Um, I can't even say the word anymore, but the, the State Department calls it aspirational, which makes me cringe. These are universal human rights. Turns out, indigenous people were not content with that. Um, indigenous people have agitated through their activism and their diplomacy in states around the world. Canada, in 2021, adopted legislation to bring its entire body of national law into alignment with the Declaration. This is our friendly neighbor, not very far to the north. Mexico City, and I worked on this when I was on MRIP, which is essentially a federal district like Washington, DC, incorporated all 46 articles of the Declaration um, into their, national, into their uh, district constitution. And, per, and New Zealand, Paraguay, I could go through states. Our national government, no, but we too are not gonna be content to let our national government keep trampling over all of our rights. And I'll say in my concluding moment, more exciting even than what all of those countries have done is what indigenous peoples themselves have done in the US and elsewhere with their own tribal governments. We have this project with the Native American Rights Fund to implement the declaration and we, we studied what tribal governments are doing in the US. They themselves are translating the declaration into their own languages. The Muscogee Creek Nation translated the whole thing, adopted it into Muscogee law, primarily to fill the gaps in the law with respect to religious, cultural, child welfare, all of those things that we're talking about. The Ho-Chunk Nation adopted the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the UN Declaration, its articles on religious and uh, language rights to protect minorities, non-Ho-Chunk people within their own societies, an amazing extension of human rights for a community that itself is denied religious freedoms um, by the United States. So I think this movement is happening. I think indigenous peoples themselves are leading the way and modeling for national um, and subnational governments what can be done. And um, if I have any hope of not living in a, a settler colonial state forever, um, that's where it is. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to start off by saying that I'm joining you from Menlo Park, San Mateo County, which sits on the traditional and ceded and ancestral homeland of the Olahone people. Indigenous communities have lived and moved through this place over hundreds of generations, and indigenous peoples from many um, nations still live here and live in this region today as well. So I feel very privileged to be in this, in this territory that I'm on. Um, and I thank you for the gift of being able to join virtually. I can't tell you what kind of envy I have of every single person who's in that room. And I really say my people are in Boston. It's not really a statement I think I've ever really said, but I feel like my people are in Boston right now. And you know, it's, it's such a privilege to be able to celebrate your work and to continue to learn from you and, and with you, and I just feel fortunate to have overlap with your spirit um, on this planet. So I'm going to say, make maybe uh, four points, uh, and, and the four points that I want to make are overlapping, they're not necessarily discreet, they pull from some of the themes that um, have been powerfully made um, and, and kind of fleshed out by the different panelists from whom I've just learned so much. And, and some of them touch on themes that I, I didn't necessarily hear um, highlighted, but I know that many of the people who um, have spoke have thought about it and have written about it as well. So rather than pretending any kind of claim to novelty, what I'm going to try and do is just share with you some of the things that are front of mind on questions of settler colonialism and the United States. So the first thing I'll say, or the first point I want to reflect on is that decolonization must be a global project or a global structure to sort of um, borrow from, from Patrick Wolf's initial insight on settler colonialism, such a close of settler colonialism being um, a structure. So I'll just say that one more time, decolonization must be a global project and a global structure. And I think 
our focus on settler colonial empire within um, the borders of the US must be pursued alongside the global projection of settler colonial power outside and, and you know, people's work, including Aziz Rana, who was on the last um, panel, who writes about the two faces um, of American empire, if I'm inspiring in this regard. And we might think about the many, many faces um, of American empire and the way that struggles here really affect and shape um, struggles everywhere. In some ways, that's what it means um, to be living in a superpower. I'm currently working on a report on climate change and, and the US is the highest global emitter and those who will suffer the most and are suffering the most, um, many of them um, are outside of the US and can exert no pressure on the US government. And so we have to think about what that means for, for people like us who are um, based here. Um, in the context of my work as Special Rapporteur recently, I learned that QAnon has been implicated in the spread of dis disinformation and mobilizing racism and xenophobic violence again, against non-white migrants and refugees in South Africa. Right? Like I've never really imagined that the dynamics that are playing out in South Africa right now can be so intimately connected to some of the dynamics that we are facing here in the, in the US and that, you know, um, white supremacy, as we know, is a transnational structure, but in a very real and immediate um, way. And so I don't think, in, in addition to thinking about the ways what happened in the U.S. affects everywhere else, I also think it's not possible to understand the U.S. settler colonial project without interrogating its manifestations and its tentacles um, abroad, because it is, it is a project that is um, ultimately transnational. So I think it's exciting to think about the ways in which some of the conversations we've been having um, in this space can link into a more global approach to thinking about decolonization, which as Nancy has so powerfully laid out in, in her book, has to be central to any kind of approach to racial justice. I fully agree with that. Um, the second theme I want to reflect on um, has to do with just empire, right? And, and thinking about imperial multiplicity, thinking about imperial mutation, and thinking about imperial camouflage. So multiplicity, mutation, and, and camouflage. And I think there is such urgent intellectual work, such urgent social work that is required to, sh to develop our shared understanding of domination through empire, whether we're talking about colonialism or settler colonialism or neo-colonialism or capitalism as an imperial system. I think we, we live in a world of multiple overlapping and interlocking imperial projects, um, many that are connected in ways that are obvious and others that are not. And I think our dominant ways of knowing and understanding are, if you ask me and many others, are, are, are tailored to mask empire and to mask its multiplicity these to mask its mutations and to camouflage it. And, and I think this is especially true in the context of law and law's relationship um, to empire. And here I'm just thinking about my own positionality, professional positionality as a law professor, a teacher, a, a knowledge producer. I think about how the privileged ways of producing knowledge in my field um, really revolve around ideals and processes that actually seem directly in conflict with producing the kinds of knowledge that I think are urgent. You know, so much of our work as, as um, academics, as lawyers, can be solitary. Um, when it comes to academic scholarship in particular, there's proprietary approaches to the ideas that we have. You have to be able to say it's my idea. Novelty has to be brand new and, and kind of ally all of the ways in which it builds upon um, and may re-articulate, but in important ways, things that have gone before. Um, the way that our fields privilege a kind of solutionism and, and a way of thinking about solutions that thinks that policy, legislative and judicial pro uh, proposal and things like that can be understood and known outside of um, processes and relationships um, that themselves produce the knowledge that we are seeking. You know, if, if you're thinking about reparations, and I think what has been so inspiring about some of the, the accounts of reparations on the ground that we've heard from, the, from uh, across the symposium is that it's not as though you go into the project knowing exactly what the outcome will be. And in fact, if you do, then there's something about that, I think, that speaks, that, that makes us, or should make us question whether the, the process can truly be reparative. I think it's it's in building relationships and getting to know people and places in very concrete ways over time and working collaboratively 
um, that we produce the kind of knowledge that we need. And unfortunately, many of the spaces that many of us are trying to produce knowledge make it actually quite difficult to, to, to produce knowledge in, in those um, ways. So just thinking about the urgency, again, of tracking imperial um, multiplicity, thinking about tracking um, the mutation of the camouflage and how community and being connected to, to, to each other in very real and immediate ways is an important part of that is something that's um, on my mind. I think on this question or on this point of mutation, I think it's also uh, been clear both from the presentations, I think this comes out in your work um, so powerfully as well, Nancy, that um, imperial domination is not static, right? And it, it, it is, it transforms itself, it spreads in ways that we haven't necessarily anticipated that it would. Um, and I think the mapping and presenting in clear terms of this complexity um, is so, so um, important. And it's, it's, an, it's a big part of understanding the silos that persist among people who are fighting against the same structures, but who are siloed into different identity or frameworks um, that make it difficult to, to um, connect. And so, so thinking about um, how we pay attention to, to mutation and how we don't think about it, it in static terms about imperial domination is something um, that I think is, is really important as well. Um, and then the final thing I'll say is so obvious and basic, you know, and I really now am a big believer in the obvious and basic things. And um, I've been thinking about the lessons that I've learned in my um, time of special rapporteur about, about decolonization and reparations in particular, because these are two things that I've been thinking about. And I say two things and that's wrong. I actually think they are intimately interconnected. I don't think you can have the colonization without reparations and, and vice versa. Um, but the biggest barrier is systemic racism, and that's that's just it. That's the tweet. The biggest barrier remains systemic racism, and um, I think that is both demoralizing but also energizing. And I'm happy to say more about that if we get to a QA and people are curious. But I'll, I'll stop there and just say that it's been such um, a privilege to learn with everyone. And I don't mean that in the way we usually say thanks on panels where you're like, thanks for giving me the invitation. You just feel like you have to. I mean truly that <laughs> this is such a gift. And so I'm, I'm just so thrilled to have been able to experience this with all of you. Last one, so I'm gonna try to, you know, honor everything that has been said. I was joking, but I was only half joking to Dan and Brinton, and I said, how come you put me, you know, with these incredible folks here? Like, I got no place here, but thank you for thinking that I can do this. So I'll try to honor uh, this great day. And, you know, it's been a while since I've been to an in-person conference. So a couple of years. Uh, for some people, but it's 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 one of those moments that you do feel like you're learning, and and I think it's we need this more than ever. So I'm so so appreciative, and I think I was as I was listening, you know, to fellow speakers, I was just thinking how uh, I was just scratching away points that I was going to make because they've been already made. But I will just stress a few that I thought about. First, I would say that from the panels that we heard today, I'm still thinking about uh, dark matter. I think that's something that I'm gonna, you know, carry with me. Thank you for that framework. I'm also thinking about kinship as solidarity and what does that mean, you know, to think about, you know, my own work. Um, I've all, I'm also been thinking about knowledge, the fact that knowledge was taken, right? So we think about land, but also knowledge and what does that mean when knowledge is also stolen? Um, then from the second panel, I've been thinking a lot about the power of the local. Right, so how a lot of movements are actually originated in the local, and sometimes we're thinking, you know, uh, bigger systemic changes, but what is the power of the local? And also, no group is homogeneous, right? And I, I don't think we can say that enough, and that was such a learning moment as well. And then the third panel, I'm still thinking about it, still, you know, um, Robin, I think you're gonna hear from me a ton after this, for good or for bad, uh, but I'm so moved, you know, by everything that was talked about, and specifically, I've been, I thought a lot about this idea of reciprocity as well in research, right? So we're all researchers, and we're, uh, the, the character of research is so extractivist, right? I'm an anthropologist, I'm a, an ethnographer, and we're never really taught 
what it is to do research that, you know, you do your institutional review boards and you think about what is ethics, but it's not actually what ethics means once you're doing it. And I think there's such, you know, a hole between uh, institutionalized ethics versus what actually means when you're doing, you know, work along folks. So um, the points that I wanted to bring in terms of things that I'm really interested in and I would love to keep the conversation going, it is uh, focused on migration, right? So the first point is um, on the gender piece, right? So a lot of my work has to do with parenting and motherhood, specifically motherhood across borders. And I think a lot about how the recent policies, especially the, the family separation policy, under the Trump administration in 2018, kind of continued the, the discussion and the vilification of a particular group of people that apparently are classified as not knowing how to do family or how to care, right? So some bodies are worthy of being cared, right? And some are not. So a lot of these families that are being judged as how, why would you put your children, right, in harm's way? Kind of thinking that's the snapshot instead of thinking what actually has caused the harm uh, for folks to try to leave and, and ask for a better life. So this idea of dignity and purpose that it's so, you know, kind of caged into for some people are able to talk about having a purposeful life or, ha or living with dignity, but not everybody that's greedy, right, for a lot of folks. So I'm always very taken by this idea of who becomes a bad mother and a bad parent and into what context that is. And that's, you know, the border policy with the family separation was just one of the many policies that the government, the U.S. government has done that kind of honed in this differentiation on who gets to be a family or exist as a family. The second point that I'm really interested in that I'd love to hear more and, and talk more about it is the childhood piece. Um, so one of the things that I work a lot is listening to children as young as babies, right? And as long as they want to communicate and kind of validating and understanding epistemologies of childhood. And this idea that, you know, specifically black and brown children, how they're perpetrated, right, by the media or how uh, different uh, literature is talking about, again, who's worthy of a childhood. So when you look at schools and there's a lot of discussion about what gets taught in a school, um, a lot of the concern for, you know, white folks in the U.S. is it's too soon, right, for how dare you expose my five-year-old to something, you know, as traumatic as racism. Well, yes, that's how a lot of children are born and raised, right? So why is it that there are some bubbles for one and for others? And I think we've heard from the panels before us that there's a reason, and that's also what Natsu talked about, social control, right? Keep, keeping people in place for that order, right, that exists. So that's a piece that it's really uh, this idea of childhood as, a, childhood as a contested space and looking at children as always in as becoming and never full beings. It's extremely problematic, especially for kids of color, right, that are in schools and their epistemologies and their knowledges are actively being stolen from them and they're not really being listened to, which leads me to my third point, which I am in a school of education, so I have to stay with my schooling and education piece, so I apologize for that but the everyday practices that we see in schools uh, continue a lot of what we talked about here right systemic racism uh, as the tweet I love that so I'll be tweeting that uh, that's the tweet that's the biggest barrier right so this idea of decolonizing education decolonizing schooling is a huge part of what we need to think about for young children right in, in the United States and one of the things that I my example for my research is programs uh, that are multilingual or bilingual programs that are built on the backs of immigrant children, right? They are the ones that have to be the native speakers in the classroom so that those programs get to exist. And who gets to enroll in those programs? You know, a lot of white children who don't speak the language, but without the, the kids that speak the language, those programs don't exist. But then what do the teachers have to do? They have to work with the white children for them, for the parents to want them to stay in those programs. Because if the kids are removed from those programs, those programs stop 
existing. So a lot of these teachers are very conscious and are very aware of potential damages that they're doing, but at the same time, they work with this paradox of I'm doing this so I can keep programs that honor children's languages alive, right? So it's a very complicated place to be, so I resist uh, you know, saying, pointing the finger at teachers that, and saying they're only solely reproducing particular dynamics when they're sometimes trying to do something that seems like the right thing, but it's damaging on the way to do it. And that's a practice that I call these pedagogies of silence, right? And that's what we see in these moments where you see children trying to get their knowledges across in these spaces. And, and I'm talking about immigrant children in schools, right? And immigrant children from Latin America, which is the population that I work with. I am from Brazil, originally from Sao Paulo. Lots of Brazilian immigrant children are here uh, in, in Massachusetts. And they're also there's also a huge piece that it's the racialization of children. So we also see in our research that black and brown children, as we all know, are you know, five times, 10 times more likely to be suspended, to be disciplined, to be not talked to, right, inside the classroom. So these are the pieces that I just wanted to bring attention to the point of the everyday practice of social control. And I'll just finish, and I, I checked with Natsu to see if that was the right quote that I wrote down from last night's um, wonderful lecture, where she said, a more equitable distribution of stolen goods is not justice. So I'll finish with that. Thank you.